Wonderful. Okay. Um, so good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, my name is Kristen Wolf, and I'm with Social Policy Research, and we're so happy that you could be here this morning um, uh, or this afternoon. Um, I see that this has already started, um, but people are introducing themselves. I'd love for um, to invite everyone to introduce themselves. Um, again, for those just joining, I'm Kristen Wolf with Social Policy Research. I'm dialing in from uh, Portland, Oregon today. Um, and I see lots of people. There's Arizona, Nevada, Louisiana. So wonderful. So I'd just like to encourage everyone as you enter, still lots of people coming in. <laughs> so uh, as you enter, go ahead and, um, and share your name and uh, what state you're calling from. Um, you know, anything else you'd like to share, just say hello. Say hello to your colleagues uh, who are growing in number with every second. <laughs> And we'll just give people uh, just a quick second before we jump into housekeeping. Iowa, Texas, Michigan, New Mexico, North Dakota, wonderful. Pennsylvania, Alabama, more Pennsylvania. So James and Jacqueline. Wonder if you're in the same place or in different places, but you're both here. Lovely to see you from Pennsylvania. Louisiana, Ohio, Arizona, Arkansas, Alaska. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Okay. Um, so uh, so I think I think we can um, probably get going now. There may be a few others joining us, but um, but it looks like we may be at the majority. Um, so uh, next slide, Crystal. Thank you. So just a few housekeeping issues. Um, once we get started in particular, we just invite you to turn on your cameras for more interaction. Certainly understand if that's not your preference or if that's not possible for you to do today, but it, it would be um, great if you're uh, willing and in a position to do so to connect with your colleagues. So just um, invite that at any time and, and in particular during our group sessions. Um, also would invite questions at any time. Um, you can submit them by chat, you can raise a hand, we'll be pausing from time to time for Q&A, but if you've got a burning question, feel free to submit it in chat. Um, we have, looks like, we're planning on a few more, it looks like we've got about 80 people um, today participating so far, so we can expect a few more, I think, um, and, and, you know, again, feel free to communicate via chat. We know a lot of you know each other and it's nice to kind of connect um, in this virtual way. Um, and then finally, if anyone needs subtitles, um, they are on um, and you access them by, um, by uh, going to the three buttons down in the corner and then a little menu will pop on um, and then you can select view subtitles in that menu. So, um, and again, if anyone has any questions or is having a hard time figuring out where that is, go ahead and feel free to submit them by chat. Um, and now, um, next slide. Uh, thank you. Now, um, we'd like to uh, turn to our speaker, Gretchen Rao, the Director of Nutrition Research at Mathematica, um, an expert in this topic. You've heard from her before. Um, and we'd like to just give her a minute to um, say hello and tell us a little bit um, about where she's coming from today. Hi. Thanks, yep, Kristen. Go, go ahead, Gretchen. <laughs> so, so as Kristen said, I'm Gretchen Rao from Mathematica. I'm the director of nutrition research here. Um, and I've studied SNAP policies over the last 20 years of my career. And really in the last eight years, I've um, nearly all of my work has focused around SNAP ENT and work requirement policies. Um, I've led a nationally representative survey of work registrants and ENT participants and ENT providers to better understand the characteristics of of those groups. Um, I also led the implementation analysis for the 10 SNAP ENT pilots, um, which is some of the, the work we'll hear about today, um, some of the findings from that. Um, those were designing and implementing innovative strategies for serving SNAP ENT participants, um, which I'm sure you've heard a lot about over the last few years. Um, and then most recently, I've been providing technical assistance to states and providers who are trying to improve recruitment into their SNAP ENT programs and find ways to keep participants engaged in their programs. So I'm really excited today to share some of what uh, we've learned through this work over the years. Thanks, Thanks so much, Gretchen. And we're so happy to have you here today. Um, okay, next slide. Wonderful. Okay. 
So um, today we're going to focus on um, community college partnerships. Um, and there are a few things we want to make sure we pay attention to. Um, one is Gretchen's going to share some kind of lessons and practical considerations some best practices, things we know work. Um, and then we're going to spend a little time, as we've done in previous sessions, brainstorming together in smaller groups. So while you're listening to Gretchen, maybe be thinking about are these are there solutions to the kinds of things she's talking about that you may have considered or have heard before or trying out yourselves? And we'll be sharing those when we break into small groups. Um, and then finally, we'll do um, a bit of reporting out. Uh, but, but before we do those things, uh, we will do um, our, our uh, poll questions like we normally do. We'll be using Menti again. Um, next slide, Crystal. Thanks so much. Um, just a couple reminders. Uh, we've used Menti before. Sometimes it's helpful to use on your phone so that you can kind of keep your screen straight. I know that that's a problem for me sometimes. And if you use it on your phone, you just go to menti.com on your phone and you type in the code. Um, you do the same thing on your screen. Um, and so what we'll do is there, there's three questions as we've done before. Um, you can uh, go ahead and go to Menti and, um, and fill out the little survey that you'll see, the first question. Um, and then we'll be seeing them on the screen here. And there's the first question. Um, and so we see, are there partnerships that you know about between community colleges and Snappy and T in your area? Wonderful. Oh, okay. Getting some more answers in. Okay. Great. So for those of you who can use Menti, looks like um, looks like you know of some partnerships and some even know of many partnerships, which is wonderful. So you'll be sure to share those when we break into breakout groups. OK, the yeses have overtaken the noes. So now we know that there's uh, information to share when we break into those groups. Wonderful. OK. I'll just give people a few more minutes. There's not, not very many answers quite yet. So just give folks finding their way to Menti a chance. Wonderful. Okay. So it looks like it's slowing down a little bit. Oh, maybe not. Just maybe another minute. Okay, now the yeses have definitely overtaken the noes. So we know there's a lot of information to share. Wonderful. Okay, great. Okay, um, let's go to the next question. And again, for those of you who are not able to use Menti, feel free to answer the question in chat. Um, so the next question is, uh, what services have you seen community colleges offer to SNAP ENT participants in your state or area? For those in Menti, you'll see some choices here. Um, otherwise, if you're using chat, go ahead and, and submit in chat. What services have you seen offer community colleges offer to SNAP participants? Um, just go ahead and submit it there. So we'll just watch what happens here. It looks like vocational skills training is a big one. Case management, also big, adult basic education, quite a, quite a variation actually. Soft skills training, wraparound and support services, vocational skills training and adult basic education seem to be um, very highly represented here. Okay. Great. Curious about that other. It, it, whoever picked other, please share in chat. We'd love to know. Okay. Great. So it uh, looks like quite a bit of vocational skills training, quite a bit of adult basic education, case management services um, rate quite, quite high, um, soft skills training and workshops, wraparound services, 
in that order. So, um, so looks like quite an array of services. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, so this one for those of you who are in chat, the question is, what are the key challenges for SNAP ENT in partnering with community colleges in your state or area? And again, um, there's some choices here. So um, we'll just give people a second to select. And for those of you using chat, just go ahead and use the chat window. What are the key challenges for uh, participating for SNAP ENT and partnering with community colleges? Ooh, looks like contracting is, is an issue. Okay, wow. Staffing, an issue. Okay. Hmm. It's kind of a big mix. Contracting, though, definitely, definitely a challenge. Okay. Wow. Okay. Good participation on this one. Okay. So contracting, staff resources, uh, lack of funding. So it looks like kind of a big mix. All right, wonderful. And it looks like some people have joined us too. More people are participating in this one. So thank you so much for that. Okay, so that, that should give you a good sense. It's kind of a big mix, but it definitely looks like um, staffing and contracting are some, some key things to be thinking about in terms of um, solutions for when we get to our uh, breakout groups. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, all right, so um, now, next slide. Thanks, Crystal. So now we'll um, turn the floor over to Gretchen and, um, and she'll share um, a heap of wisdom on this topic. Uh, and that ought to set us up nicely for talking when we get into our small groups. So turn it over to Gretchen. Thanks so much. Thanks. Um, so welcome everyone and thanks for coming today. I'm going to share some of the things that states should be considering when providing snap ENT services through community colleges. And these were learned from the snap ENT pilots. Um, we also will try to provide some on the ground examples of effective approaches for dealing with potential challenges that could help you as you are partnering or expanding your partnerships with community colleges. Um, so as everyone knows, you have com considerable flexibility in how you deliver SNAP ENT services. And while there are a few states that provide ENT services directly through the SNAP agencies, most states are contracting with local ENT providers, um, such as community-based organizations or for-profit training organizations and workforce agencies. But community colleges can also be a really important ENT partner for states. So they generally have the size and capacity to offer a range of trainings that would meet the varying needs of your SNAP participants. And they also have the flexibility and resources often that are needed to scale up SNAP ENT programs, at, at, which is something that smaller providers may not have. Um, they also may be able to pivot more easily if additional services or classes are needed for a big influx of participants. So more specifically, next slide. Um, more specifically, community colleges offer um, this range of training services at a single location. So while a community-based organization may offer one or two types of training programs, community colleges off obviously offer a whole range of, um, of opportunities at a single location. They also have the organizational structure and administrative resources needed to administer a robust SNAP ENT program, which as you know, can be you know, pretty complicated and resource intensive. Um, they also already reach a diverse population. So they are serving a range of people, but um, this includes non-traditional students who often live in low-income households. So they may already be serving people who are receiving or are eligible for SNAP. And those households also are probably eligible for SNAP ENT services as well. Um, therefore, community colleges are actually a really nice, they already have kind of a nice pool of people who are likely eligible for SNAP ENT um, that could be targeted. 
Also, community colleges serve rural communities often. So they're placed all over the state, but a lot of times they're in more rural communities as well. Um, and that can be where um, there isn't a lot of workforce development services or other providers available already. Um, also, as I saw from the poll, um, some community colleges serve individuals um, who have not earned a high school diploma or equivalent by co-locating adult education programs on campus. And having basic education and occupational skills training at one location makes it a lot easier for, um, for participants to be able to transition from, um, you know, building up their skills into a training program without, um, and it reduces potential drop off if they're not co-located. And then finally, um, some community colleges also have the infrastructure to be, to provide essentially like a one-stop location for SNAP and t services. So I saw from the poll that some of the community colleges are already providing um, support services and case management. And so there is a possibility that a, a a uh, community college can do everything at one location and you don't need other providers to um, to refer to um, for those services. For instance, in the pilots, there were two, um, two of the pilots in Mississippi and Virginia who all of their services were offered through the community college. So that included case management, participant reimbursements, adult basic education, obviously training, vocational training programs, um, as well as some work-based learning opportunities as well. Um, and what we actually found um, was that once people got to the college and, and started engaging in services, they were completing activities, their various activities and receiving training certifications at much higher rates, sometimes double um, of those who were not getting all of their services at, at the community college through the one location. Next slide. So although there are many benefits to partnering with community colleges, we learned through the 10 SNAP ENT pilots that ran from 2016 through 2019 um, that there are um, some challenges inherent in working with community colleges. As I mentioned, two of the pilots were administering all of their services through community colleges. However, many of or most of the other pilots partnered with community colleges in some way. Um, most of them had the ha, were working with community colleges just as one of several providers in the area, and they um, usually were just referred to for a training program. However, there were a few um, a few of the pilots who also did kind of a hybrid approach where they had other providers, but the community college also could provide adult basic education. Um, they had some success coaches. They also offered work study for some of the ENT participants who were um, in a training program. So they offered more than just the training at some locations. Next slide. So the pilots found that community colleges generally um, were not accustomed to working with um, within public assistance programs or with public assistance programs. Some of them struggle to understand the SNAP ENT uh, rules for students. Um, work requirement policies for ABODs was also um, sometimes confusing for them. Um, financial reimbursement constraints were, um, were always a little bit difficult to navigate. And then the reporting requirements, and I think we saw that in the poll as well, um, just the level of reporting that was needed was, um, was more than community colleges were, were used to, and they had to set up new systems for that. Um, the states and the grantees also found um, some kind of unexpected structural and eligibility challenges related to wait times to access training um, and that not all SNAP ENT participants are eligible um, or have access to services at community colleges. Um, also, they found that often community college staff didn't have the existing tools or some of the expertise to provide all of the SNAP ENT services in the way that they needed to be provided um, uh, as part of the core, core ENT program. So today I'm gonna talk about four of the primary challenges that emerged um, through the pilots. And I'll also talk about how the pilots addressed them where possible when they were able to find solutions to some of these things. 
Um, and so hopefully these findings can provide you with useful lessons um, when you're considering partnership or trying to expand your partnerships with community colleges. Okay, next slide. Okay, so um, first I want to just talk about um, the fact that, you know, well, community colleges offer a range of services and there's a lot of again a lot of benefits to working with them they may not always be a good fit for all ent participants so community colleges establish their own criteria for qualifying for each training course um, which everyone is not going to be able to meet so everyone coming through your program um, and some snap participants just may not really be ready for or willing to start training at a community college, it just may not be what's of interest to them. Um, so some of the things that we found um, in particular were that um, most of the community colleges require um, some type of aptitude testing, a CASAS or a TABE test. Um, some participants were really resistant to even taking the test in the first place. They just had sort of a, a fear of testing. Um, and then others that did take the test eventually didn't actually attain the needed scores. So they would have to be referred to adult basic ed or some other course to build up those skills in order to improve their, their testing. Um, a few of the colleges that did work closely with or had adult basic ed co-located had some success in helping increase those scores and then sort of just transitioning quickly into, you know, into uh, training on the campus, but many people just really didn't follow up. If they if they didn't get the score that they needed, they kind of felt a little defeated, and a lot of people just didn't want to go on to adult basic ed. So um, so that was often a barrier for getting people into training. Also, um, generally, you need a high school diploma or equivalent to enroll in a community college, and in the pilots, um, you know, twenty to thirty percent of people who enrolled. Uh, didn't have a high school diploma or or the equivalent at the start of the program. So that's a fairly large population that doesn't have a high school diploma to start with. And so again, those people won't be able to quickly move into um, uh, go to a community college. There were a couple of community colleges that did have an accelerated opportunities program, which is again, talking a lot about adult basic ed, but adult basic ed, is on campus, you um, you can enroll in that, work on your GED and still co-enroll in some training classes um, uh, while you're getting your GED. Um, but that wasn't very um, prevalent in, at least in the, in the community colleges that we were looking at. Also, some participants just really discussed the fear about going back to school or being on a campus or in a campus setting. Um, and this was particularly for um, people who had been out of school for a really long time. Uh, the average age of the individuals, um, this is probably going to sound familiar to you as well, is about 32 to 39 in the pilots. Um, so most of those people have really been out of school for 10, you know, 15, 20 years. And, um, and so the staff and case managers really had to work with those clients to kind of demystify um, the idea of going to school or being on a college campus to try to get them over those fears um, to to work with community college. Next slide. Okay. So another issue that um, that came up frequently that I don't think anyone really anticipated um, within the pilots was that um, if you have outstanding debt at the community college, you can't enroll in new training. Um, so um, the grantees were really surprised by the frequency at which individuals and in the pilots had started at a community college in the past and had some level of unpaid college tuition bills that were outstanding. Um, they could, you know, they could range from anywhere from just, you know, a hundred, you know, about a hundred dollars to several thousand dollars. Um, but most of them were pretty old. It wasn't as if someone was just in community college last year and, and um, hadn't finished paying off their bill. It could have been like 10, 15 years ago, they went in, um, started community college right after um, high school and then just dropped out and, and didn't actually finish paying off their, their bills. 
So while SNAP ENT can pay for new training and all the costs associated with new training, they can't pay off those old debts. And so participants had to find funds to pay off their prior debt in order to start this new training. And in most cases, participants just don't, didn't have the money, they don't have the money to be able to, um, to fund that. Um, next slide. So there were, um, a few of the pilots were able to find alternatives to this so that people could still get training or get services. Um, a few offered training through local CBOs or for-profit organizations in the same area. So if this was the case and it was, they were offering a similar um, type of training that the person wanted, they would just move them into those other programs and, and just avoid the community college altogether. Um, one of the pilots um, in Mississippi that was offering all of their services at the community college, um, while they couldn't enroll in a training program um, that was offered to everybody in the community through the community college, there were services that were provided for SNAP ENT specifically. So things like they had developed a life skills training and job readiness course. They had some work-based learning on campus. Um, there were job placement and the case management services. They could still provide all of those services to the client. They just couldn't get uh, enroll into a, a specific training program there. Um, so those were some of the workarounds for that. Next slide. So um, wait times to enter training can also be a, a pretty major problem. And it's something that everyone will face, all the states will face this when working with a community college. So obviously as you're, you're consistently enrolling people, I'm sure all of your states are pretty similar that SNAP participants are flowing into the SNAP ENT program consistently each month or, or coming through each month. Whereas a training program at a community college is frequently offered just on a quarterly or semester basis. So anyone who um, is enrolled into SNAP ENT um, just after a training program starts will have to wait for the next class. And these waiting periods can be a few weeks or a few months, depending on the course itself. At community colleges, the, the waits tend to be a little bit longer than at some of the CBOs and, and for-profit organizations. So it usually ended up being more like months. Um, so what we found is that these wait periods often resulted in participants not starting training at the community colleges at all. Um, some individuals just decided to drop out of SNAP ENT altogether because they weren't interested in any other activities and they didn't want to wait. Um, some people were worried about being out of the workforce for so long of, you know, having a few months of a wait period as well as then completing the training. It could be six to 12 months before they get a job. So they ended up just going and getting a job and really never came back to do training. Um, others just started another um, activity or in another component, um, it, you know, it kind of went down a different pathway and then just never went back to training. Um, or others may have just went to a CBO or another um, partner and got some, some other type of training in the community. Um, waiting periods are particularly problematic though for um, people who have a work requirement that affects their SNAP eligibility. So if you're an ABOD or you're um, in a mandatory ENT program, um, this, the, the, the state needs to really work with community colleges and other providers in the community to ensure that during these waiting periods, people are able to fill their time um, and, um, and hopefully in sort of useful skill building activities. Um, in Mississippi, the, the staff and participants talked a lot about um, the fact that they kind of ended up in filler activities or felt like they were doing busy work and it wasn't a lot of them weren't really satisfied with what they were doing during the wait periods. Um, in Illinois, who also was running a, a mandatory program at the time, um, some providers were able to offer job readiness training, some a course like that, um, while people were waiting, but that wasn't consistently offered um, across all of the um, all of the colleges. Um, there were a few um, a few other. Uh, pilots that were able to better sort of manage this. One of the pilots offered online self-paced digital literacy, uh, soft skills training, and job readiness training while people were waiting. So it 
was, you know, sort of these useful skills that they were building up that could actually even help them in their training programs. Um, and that was offered to everybody who was waiting. Um, and then some of the colleges were able to offer or add and offer additional classes, um, uh, sort of off cycle. Um, for a few of the occupations when there were large enough cohorts waiting, but that was fairly rare because you'd need a, a pretty big group of people in a specific occupation um, or a specific for a specific training class for them to be able to do that, to pivot, to do that. Okay. Next slide. And so the, the um, last piece I want to talk a little bit about is providing case management and job placement services, which is not always a strength for community colleges. Um, so it looked like in the um, in the poll that there was a lot of case management being provided. Um, one of the things that is just core to understand is what does a community college mean by case management? Um, some of the campuses offered career navigation or um, or success coaches or coaching of some kind. But a lot of times that focuses on helping students select classes and navigate the college system. It isn't the kind of case management we think about for the in kind of intensive case management for SNAP ENT. Um, so typically they weren't offering or providing any kinds of assessments. Um, the day-to-day -day kind of case management that's needed for participants or any of the support services kind of participant reimbursements that that are done. So in the pilots that um, were working with the community colleges where they were sort of key partners, the community colleges had to hire new staff to provide case management, um, again, intensive case management, and also had to develop procedures for providing providing it consistently and really trying to understand what that meant in um, in the terms of a SNAP ENT program for that group. Um, and just one note, like if if the college is not able to provide the case management, that's fine, but state agencies need to work with other providers in the community to either figure out whether, like who is providing that case management and participant reimbursement and making sure that there is a connection between the community colleges and whichever organizations are providing the case management. So there's a good um, flow of communication when someone's you know, in a training program and also needs their support services or needs case management. Next slide. So um, job placement services was also something that a lot of the community colleges weren't already doing a lot of, um, for at least the, the co community colleges we were look, working with in the pilots. Um, so while they're doing training at, you know, specifically for a lot, usually specifically for certain occupations, a lot of the community colleges didn't have direct um, uh, sort of direct interaction with employers or connections to employers when people were looking for employment. Um, so they had, and it was really, they struggled often to develop those skills um, at, or develop those um, relationships at the community college themselves. Some of the participants also um, talked about kind of how frustrated they were that they, they really didn't have these robust services and it didn't feel like they had um, any connections to employers for hiring once they did complete their training programs. Um, other pilots just sort of, or other community colleges sort of for, for went that for, they forego that, that they would just refer out to other providers in the community that, um, like the workforce agencies, like a WIOA agency and AJC, or another community-based provider that does a lot of job placement and already have those connections to employers. It's just that a lot of community colleges didn't even, didn't really have connections to those providers. So they had to build those connections and make sure they had good places to refer people to um, when they were finishing up their training. So again, another piece of just making sure they're, they're, that those connections are in place. Okay, next slide. So those were some of the, the primary um, uh, challenges that we sort of found when working with community colleges. Um, hopefully that helps you a little bit as you're exploring new and expanded partnerships with community colleges and, and these lessons will help provide some practical considerations. 
Um, we also have uh, a few questions to, for you to think about if you're able to answer these questions with community colleges, with other providers in the community, it'll really help ensure that those participants who are going to community colleges are being well served. Um, so the first question to really think about when you're starting this process is, do we have other providers and activities available to those who are not interested in training at a community college or do not qualify? And the second question, which is related, but it's for participants who still want training, they actually do want training. Um, are there other providers available for those who are not able to enroll at a particular community college, either because they don't meet certain criteria or because they have some kind of outstanding debt? Next slide. And then the, the next thing to think about are what are the steps that we can take to limit waiting times? Um, and again, particularly for those who um, have work requirements, what activities are available to them during those wait periods so that they're not gonna lose their SNAP eligibility, um, but still are able to go into a training program if that's the, the path that they want to follow. And then finally, can the community college provide additional services needed for SNAP ENT participants, such as case management, uh, support services, which participant reimbursements, um, and job placement. And, um, and again, and this is at the level that you need for SNAP ENT, right? So they, they may say that they do some of this, but it's, it's making sure that it meets your requirements for the SNAP ENT program for what, what you need them to be doing. Um, and if they don't have that capacity, then how can we provide those services either ourselves through the SNAP agency or through other partners or providers in the community itself? Okay. Next slide. Okay, so all the information that I've talked about is really just summarizing information that's presented in um, a policy brief on community colleges, which is on the website on the screen. And it's also, yes, yeah, coming up in the chat. Um, we also have a lot of additional um, policy briefs and uh, full reports on the pilots, if you're interested. Um, we have interim reports and briefs, and we also have final reports and briefs are at different links. Um, and again, they're being put in the chat as well. Great. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Gretchen. Um, I hope at this point your heads are spinning and full of information that you'd like to share with your colleagues. Um, and just as a reminder, I saw a few people just popped in. Um, so there are resources in the chat that Caleb just posted um, that uh, cover the, the content that Gretchen was sharing. Um, and now, speaking of Caleb, um, we'll uh, shift to our group activity and I'll um, turn it over to Caleb to explain um, what we're going to do. Thanks so much, Kristen, and thanks so much, Gretchen. I really uh, appreciate the uh, uh, excellent and comprehensive overview and for, uh, and Kristen, all your hosting abilities. So um, as we've gotten to do with uh, the last couple of sessions um, that we've had together, we're gonna think about how to apply uh, or at least advance some of the, 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 the interesting information that we've heard about um, and get to work together as well. Um, one of the, the opportunities that presentations like this uh, afford us is to actually get to uh, interact with our peers that are across the country or across our re different regions that we don't normally get to interact with um, in these sorts of settings. Um, so in a moment, and I think as you heard about early, earlier in the presentation, we're gonna go into breakout groups. Um, and what we're gonna be doing is sharing experiences that we've had with some of these challenges and just start to explore uh, the ways that we might go about to address them. And the aim here is really just to think about how we can advance partnerships in our own regions, even when they're hard to come by, or even when the particular issue is a naughty one. Um, a lot of the challenges um, that we've heard about um, from Gretchen and through the report and whatnot, um, they're system problems. They're not problems that can be solved by a single person or a single entity, um, certainly not easily, oftentimes not at all. It really requires collaboration and partnership in order to make something like that go. That said, um, that doesn't mean that we can't formulate ideas or, or capture um, ideas that might help 
um, break through some particular really sticky point that we uh, we found ourselves in um, with some of these partnerships. And so what we're going to do is we're going to randomly assign everybody um, into groups. There's nothing that you need to do on your end. Um, and once more, we're also going to work in Jamboards. So why don't we um, move forward real quick? And before we get to the Jamboards, and I'll show everybody again how that works um, if, uh, if it's been a while since you've used it. Um, but before jumping into the logistics, I just want to re re-highlight the uh, four common challenges that we just heard about um, that Gretchen uplifted for us. Those were in broad terms, community colleges not necessarily being a fit for all ENT participants. It's outstanding community college debt preventing access um, for, for participants. It's likely uh, the, the likelihood of having wait times um, for entering training, and then it's providing case management and job placement that's not always a strength for the community colleges um, themselves, and so they need some sort of help doing that. Next slide, please, Crystal. And so what our Jamboards are gonna look like, um, this is an example of the slides that we're gonna see, okay? Everybody's gonna have a facilitator in their room. Once you get to your breakout room, your facilitator will share a link for you that will go to a Jamboard. For folks that were with us last time around, we successfully broke Google, which was kind of amazing um, and something that I've personally never done before. And so in order to ameliorate that problem, we've actually created separate Jamboards for each group. Um, so there's not one big one that we're all working within. Um, so when you get to your group, your facilitator will share a link. You'll click that link and then you'll be able to interact with uh, the Jamboard with just your group there. Okay, and what you'll do is working from the top left corner and then moving around clockwise will um, take a few minutes to consider these particular problems. And um, what we want to extract is ideas or, or, or workarounds that folks are aware of. Maybe you've done, um, you've, you've actually seen it modeled personally in your own area. Maybe it's something you've heard about. Um, at a conference, maybe it's something that you've actually done. You found kind of little workarounds in order to uh, overcome some of these naughty problems uh, that folks have, have existed. We want to hear about those. We want to just jot that down using the sticky note tool that we have within Jamboard in order to make that happen. Okay, so let me show everyone how to refresh everybody just quickly how Jamboards works. I think I'm going to need to share my screen and let me make sure I do so correctly. Hopefully I do so correctly. Okay, so this is what a, a room will look like when you're in Jamboard. Um, and the only thing you'll need to do is grab sticky notes. Along the left-hand side, there's a set of controls here. And the sticky note control is this little um, hollow or black outline white inset uh, button here. You click on that, it'll bring up a little pop-up picture that says sticky note, and you can type whatever you want to here. If you'd like, you can change the color by clicking it. It doesn't really matter. And you just click save. And it's ready for you to write another sticky note if you want to, but if you don't want to, you can click out of that. And then you have the ability to move the sticky note around, to reposition it and size it if you want to. The one caveat I just want people to be careful about is in order to interact with the Jamboards, because this is a, a sharing tool or a sharing system where we all get to edit it and interact with it, is it means that you can actually manipulate and change the Jamboard itself. And in order to keep things clean and straight, I've literally created boxes that are liftable and movable, and then it gets confusing if you accidentally grab and lift them. Um, so try not to do that. Just use the sticky notes if you need to move them. Alternatively, if you're having difficulty with the typing piece, you can use the chat in order to type in there, and then uh, and then your facilitator or a, a friendly compatriot who is in your, your group can actually type out a little sticky note for you, okay? Okay. I will stop my sharing. I'll, uh, I don't know if I need to give controls back. Thank you, Crystal. I'll give controls back to you regardless. Um, failing any questions, I think we're going to be good. So we'll have about 20 minutes. I anticipate that we won't get through all four quadrants, but we'll get somewhere between three and five minutes, ideally, between each quadrant moving clockwise, and we'll at least get 
you know, three quarters of the way around. And then we'll see everybody back here um, to look at what people came up with or what people talked about. All right, away you go. All right, yeah, we're, I'm, okay. I'm coming back. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Uh, how's everybody doing? Um, hopefully that, um, well, that may have not felt like quite like enough time, uh, perhaps it was uh, a little bit rushed. I think we were, we had a, at least in my group, we um, had a slightly slow start, but then it started to really kind of heat up um, and have lots to talk about. Uh, I left in the middle of being able to ask a question, but that's okay. Maybe I'll ask it um, in the time that we have available to us um, here. So, what we want to do now is uh, actually ask groups, each group, to um, to have perhaps a brave volunteer kind of uplift or share some of the ideas or concepts or discussion points that came up in each of their breakouts. And the purpose of doing this is we were able to break out into smaller groups, have a little bit more of an intimate conversation, but we want to make sure that what was um, brought forth in each of these groups um, can benefit everybody, or at least everybody can um, can hear about it. And so um, we want to give that opportunity. I forget who was room number one. Who was who was number one? I think that was me. Okay. Um, and I don't know if you want to pull up the jam board. I, I mean, the group in my room were incredibly expert. Uh, I, we had um, former community college advisors. Uh, I mean, it was really rich. So if you can, if you can show them a picture of the gym board, you'll see it's just covered in stickies um, and really great ideas. Crystal, are you able to pull that up, or would you like me to? I'm happy to. Um, uh, are but, you able to pull it up? I'm sorry. What did you say? Did you want? Uh, are you able to pull it up? Yeah, let me, let me, let me take, oh my goodness, quite a lot too. Okay, let yeah. me take control of. Yeah, I need the visual because I just want you guys to see that, um, that. Uh, oh boy. There was a ton of great ideas and feedback, but we, no one was very chatty. So I didn't, uh, I didn't get a chance. We really did not have a discussion. We just had like this major, major brainstorming going on and sharing. So um, I thought the most exciting thing that Riz from Kentucky was just sharing is that she and her community college partner in Kentucky are actually gonna go to Oregon together and do um, like a field trip. And, and Riz, you were just telling me about it. I don't know if you wanna share with other states about, you know, who exactly if you're going to Portland or if you're going to a different community college location and and what your itinerary is because I think it's um they they have such a great program there um we are going in October and I believe we're going to visit Mount Hood Community College um so we the state agency as well as um representatives from the Jefferson Community Technical College Jefferson County as well as um, one of our providers who that's a workforce agency, Kentuckiana Works. So we're all gonna go to Oregon and, and kind of hear from them and how well um, their program is going, see what we can learn um, to do that. So I'm looking forward to it because um, we do want to expand our partnerships with um, the Kentucky Community Technical College System. Right now, we only have one campus that's an ENT um, partner, but we want to expand that. There's 16 counties across uh, campuses across the state, so we'd love to know how to get them to join in and be part of the ENT. So we're excited. That's so great. I got to interview um, the staff at Louisville at that at the community college, and they just seem to be doing such a great job. So it's really exciting to to hear that you're expanding. So I'd say that's the highlight from room one. That's great. Thank you so much, Madeline and everybody. And we're I realize we're going to need to find a way to actually take a screenshot of this and add it to the slide deck so people can refer to it later if they would like as well, just within the slide deck that we send out. Okay. 
So uh, let's go to room two. I, uh, I believe that was Gretchen's room. I'll do the screen share uh, again for each of these. I just have to go get the link here. But um, Gretchen, or if there's somebody in your room that would like to, um, to speak about what you, what you all um, shared, that would be lovely. Yeah, sorry, I, I got um, I got pulled out of the room before the end before we identified someone. So I don't I don't know, James, if you would want to talk a little bit about um, what we put on the board. I think you had maybe the most to to say around that. We're not I'm sure you're more than adequately capable of doing that. <laughs> OK, <laughs> no problem. Diplomatic, very diplomatic. Yes. <laughs> not a problem. So we um, we kind of got through the first two quadrants of for discussion and then we're on the third by the time we, we pulled out. So I think the first thing that we talked about was um, providing case management and job placement services. And a lot was related to, there's sort of two, two parts to that was one was um, focusing on co-enrolling with um, AJCs and WIOA organizations so that they could provide that job placement and some of the case management that that um, community colleges may not be able to. And then the other was trying to bolster the community colleges through funding. So actually having them hire um, staff who could be dedicated to case management and job placement services for ENT. Um, and sort of build those capes at the at the community college themselves. So those were kind of the the two pieces there. Um, and then the the college debt prevention um, or preventing access is is a tough one. Um, I mean, there were a couple of ideas about just obviously having other places where people can go get training and you know avoiding the community college. Um, there was a discussion about you know the the college debt forgiveness may end up helping with this if that you know goes through at the federal level and then also there was an idea about getting some kind of short-term credentials to be able you know at another location to get employment to then be able to pay down the debt and then getting some more long-term training at a community college so there's sort of a pathway to being able to eventually get to the community college for for training um, so I, I think those are kind of the big things that that jumped out for our discussion Great. Thanks so much, uh, Gretchen and uh, Room, so much. Let's go to room three. I believe this was Anne's room. I'm yes. bringing it up. Yes, this is um, room three. And we actually had uh, Zachary, uh, who volunteered to share back. So I really appreciate it, especially because he mentioned he's in New Mexico and they don't actually currently do uh, community college partnerships. So that was uh, especially um, brave of him to want to share back with you all. So thank you. Um, but we had, yeah, a lot of ideas um, coming up. So thanks to the whole group. Righty, hello, everybody. I know some of us are afternoon, some of us are still morning. Um, but yeah, like you said, we're in state of New Mexico, we're just kind of taking everything in. Um, so the more we can learn, the more conversations we have, the better. Um, we have got through three of the four quadrants pretty well. Uh, the first one, community colleges, not a fit. Um, we have a statement of need to develop and encourage, oh, sorry about that. Uh, need to develop and encourage referrals to other ENT providers if a potential student does not meet the school criteria for enrollment. Um, also connecting colleges with CBOs to provide case management and support services. Um, moving on to the second for that standing community college debt prevent, uh, prevents the access. We had the idea of enrolling in non-credit classes. Uh, typically past debt does not affect those types of classes. Um, also, of course, referring to other ENT providers for other ENT services. Um, and the one that kind of struck me as the, the most important was using reimbursement dollars already received to pay off the outstanding debt, um, but not requesting more reimbursement um, on that cost. Um, that was just one that, that really stuck out to me because I had a, several friends and family who were kind of in that situation there. Um, and also finding other community resources to fill the need. Um, that is something here in New Mexico that we really have to focus on. Uh, just because of our the sparse population densities that we have. Some areas have a whole lot, some areas don't have very many. Um, now down in, the, in the, the fourth one, providing case management and job placement, not always the strengths for community uh, colleges. 
Um, for this one, we had an idea of having an intermediary provide all the case management, um, so kind of having that in between uh, person in between the ENT provider and the participants. And also case, admin, case management is a huge administrative burden as reported by our community college providers. Um, that right there is the one that sticks out to me. And I had a, a conversation with Annabelle as well. There's just a whole lot of moving pieces there that, that would be a, a concern, definitely from our side of trying to get everyone on the same page, first and foremost. Um, but if anyone else wants to, to chime in, I think that pretty much covers most of it. Yeah, and, and thank you so much, Zachary. That was great. Um, really great summary of what we um, added to the board. So I appreciate it. Great. Thanks so much, Zachary. And, and uh, I was room four. I already have it clicked up. I'm happy to speak. I'm also um, happy to have any, uh, any of our group jump in um, a little bit. But we had actually several folks in our room who were just at the beginning of developing partnerships with their community colleges and did not have experience with any of these problems. And maybe we um, <laughs> instilled them with a slight sense of doom, or perhaps we're giving them great hope <laughs> um, in, uh, uh, with, with some of these ideas. Um, there were a couple of uh, I, items that came up, especially when thinking about long wait times or case management in particular, uh, which involved um, some of what we've already heard about um, utilizing um, WIOA um, or, or other programs to make use of case management when community colleges don't offer it. Um, some folks talked about making use of adult education um, at, uh, in lieu of community college when, it, when there was a need for training. Um, we did talk about how, you know, strategies for dealing with wait times and, uh, you know, one person mentioned that um, their programs, they won't, they typically are what they're, it hasn't happened yet, but one strategy they're planning is to not even advertise their programs until about a month before school starts. So essentially they're moving the SNAP programs that are available to adhere to the college timeline. Um, in the first place, um, so that the wait time does not become uh, as much of an issue. And then we also, we actually moved into a little bit of a conversation, a more broad conversation about um, uh, partnership strategies broadly um, that worked. And, um, and so folks came, came up with ideas about um, donating staff time to manage things like um, managing data um, between system partners. Um, partnering in, instead of with a single community college, partnering with a college system as a whole as a way to mitigate the lengthy contract negotiation that can take, uh, that can be required um, when trying to establish an MOU or other sort of uh, agreement um, with a college itself. Um, and then one, one person also mentioned that they had uh, the college in, in um, starting to partner with them, a college come to them uh, ready to off offer a navigator, um, uh, which was not expected. And so there was a sudden need to pivot to find resources in order to um, make use of the, uh, the, the partnership offering that the college was able to make and came to up front um, in order to maintain that relationship and then ultimately ideally build upon it over time. Um, was there anything else that, that folks wanted to raise from our group? Um, that I didn't capture effectively. Okay, with that, keeping an eye on time, we got a couple of more groups here. Let me go to number five, which was Chris. Hi, Caleb. Hi. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, we, we got sort of kicked out of our room before we had established who had summarized too. So I'll jump in and then uh, I, I'll invite anyone in, in um, the room with me to go ahead and, um, and compliment what I say. But uh, like your room, we were uh, pretty early in the process. So um, we had good representation from Alaska and Arizona who are both just getting started with partnerships. Um, so we kind of talked across the four issues, but, um, but through that, I'll extract a couple of, uh, of lessons or a couple of, um, of solutions. Um, so in Arizona's case, um, they're working with the National Skills Coalition in a really kind of planful way. 
and are um, starting small. So they're starting with a particular program, which already has at a particular college, which already has expertise um, with uh, supportive services and a, and a much wider array of services, as well as a rich, diverse network of nonprofits. So the, the ecosystem of supports is already there. And so they're, they're working with that that program in particular, um, so that they can learn from it and also to, um, to um, boost the chances of success. Um, so that was one kind of potential solution across the areas. Um, and then one thing I'll draw out from what Alaska was saying, um, Alaska has, they're partnering with the university system, which also has community colleges tied to it. And um, in, the, in those cases, the, uh, the placement, the job placement part is a real strength, especially tied to key industries throughout the state. Um, but it's on the front end um, that they're a, a little bit concerned about. And so it's really important to kind of assess the strengths of the institutions you're working with and figure out where those gaps are. And, and that is a gap. And so they're working on that now as um, sort of trying to figure out in that front in the in the sort of onboarding area, um, the case management piece and the um, additional services and potentially um, GED and um, that sort of set of services. So they're working on that now. Again, as you say, very early in the process. But um, uh, and then I guess the third um, the third uh, uh, kind of solution I'll draw out again across the four areas. Um, it relates to this idea of um, of sort of fit and the need to boost case management. And we, we didn't really have a lot of solutions in that area, but it is something that everyone um, indicated that they were working on. Um, so, you know, looking at what kinds of match can be established, how do you build the skills of um, people who are already doing case management to do a more enhanced version of case management. So there's different um, different um, solutions all early in uh, all kind of at the early stage. So I and just invite um, Robertine or Loretta or either Melissa um, or Chelsea or Christina to add add to that. And um, add in chat too if you'd like to. Oh, Melissa, awesome. No, I'm just going to okay. say I think you've covered it really well. I don't have anything additional to add um, beyond kind of what you went over. It's a very detailed overview. Wonderful. Thanks, all. Okay, one more group, uh, and that is uh, my wonderful colleague, Vince. So let me bring your group up, group six. Hey, Caleb, thanks for bringing up the screen here. Um, so we had a lively uh, both. <laughs> Uh, posting of sticky notes and then a discussion about them, uh, remembering that these are jumbled in different orders now from what you might have seen. So in the upper left-hand corner, the uh, case management, some good ideas about what uh, college community colleges could do, both to kind of peer-to-peer -peer instructions on how to do this, uh, contracting solutions, or in-kind kind of contribution from CBOs as ways to address the question of uh, uh, of providing uh, case management services on the, in the lower left hand corner the um the wait time issue obviously prominently featured the online platforms the college has got a lot of experience with that now um but also the idea of finding ways to um, have open entry open exit uh, models um, be offered as a way to reduce the wait times. Upper right, um, the question of the fit, um, obviously, uh, well, one discussion we had was about bridge programs as a way to do that, both that they're not that easy to pull off, but that they can be applied as a way to provide some contextualized uh, adult and vocational at uh, skills um, as, a, as a way to improve, uh, you know, and get someone ready for the community college. And then finally, in the lower right-hand corner, the whole question of debt, um, you know, it's a creative option. We, we didn't really have an example of, of anyone doing this, but, you know, a way to offer to uh, basically compensate someone being able to, to work off their debt by participating in the training. I thought that was a particularly creative solution. And I know we're at the time, otherwise uh, I'm sure there were others that might wanna have, have ways to contribute to this discussion, but great discussion and great uh, posting. So I'm, we're gonna be looking forward to share those with everyone.
Wonderful. Thanks so much, Vince and everybody. Yep, we're just winding down on the time here. So thanks everyone for your participation in that. And I think I get to pass it once more back to uh, Kristen to take us out, I believe. I think so. And I'm just bouncing around on screens for the minute. <laughs> um, yep. All right. Um, so thanks for, uh, thanks everyone. And if there's any final um, comments or questions, I just invite you to either raise a hand or uh, put it in the chat. Um, so we'll just give people a second to do that. But um, otherwise, just uh, thanks everyone for um, joining today, for being so engaged. Um, and as a reminder, when you close out, there'll be a survey that'll pop up. Um, it's anonymous and it'll just give us some feedback that'll help us plan future trainings. So um, I really appreciate it. And, uh, and then finally, some of you asked in the chat, but um, materials from the training will be sent out in the next couple of weeks. So um, again, thanks so much for your participation and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Have a great rest of your week. <laughs>